Our scripture lesson today is found in the book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 23. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Deacon. I love church, don't you? And I love doing church and being church. I love when we get to experience those who are baptized, dying with Christ in order to rise with Him. Our children who are dedicated unto the Lord and the kids who play and find this happy, joyful place. And I love the music. Thank you, Michael. And I and Mark. It's a testimony that we follow everyone through their life and birth. And even so, as we grieve the loss of Marion, we don't grieve as the world does, but rather grieve with hope, which is met with gratitude that our saints are in communion with God. And we are thankful for that too. It's awesome to come to a place where we get to celebrate our little ones and our saints who have passed before us. And perhaps this sermon is good for that reason. A few people have asked me along the way, you need to tell another story about your dad. And I try not to burden you with that because it can be too much sometimes. Uh, but one I thought of was quite appropriate. My father was a TV VCR repairman, and in the back of his shop, he always owned his own shop, he had what was called, we called the graveyard. This is where all of the broken televisions would go and retire, and dad would use them for spare parts or whatever. And if your TV ended up in the graveyard, that was it. You were in trouble. You just had to buy a new one. Sometimes he would rebuild TVs and sell them when he had all the parts uh, down the road. And most often in our household, we never had any TV. It was a TV pieced together from all of everything in the graveyard. That's how we lived. Secondhand TVs and VCRs that word and uh, as the world as they ran. My cousins uh, who grew up with us. Uh, uh, and my, my dad helped raise There's one co co cousin in particular, his name was Matthew. One time we were in my dad's shop, I must have been in high school, and we were back there, and my cousin was looking through the graveyard, and he said, Joe, and my, my cousin's from New York, so, Joe, you see this? When your dad dies, this is all yours. <laughs> and, yeah, this is what you're going to inherit right here in the graveyard. A few years later, Matthew's TV died, and so my dad came over and we were there, and Matthew said, you know, Vinny, you need to fix my TV. So my dad took off the back of the TV and was looking, it was a big screen TV, and he said to God, just throw it away. You don't need to just buy a new one. No, Vinny, you gotta fix my TV. I'm not gonna buy a new one. This is a good TV, this is top of the line. I'm not gonna go out and buy a new one. It's a piece of junk, throw it out. So my cousin convinced him to take the television, so my dad took the television. About a month went by, and my cousin said, Vin, where's my TV? I would have applied to some, I don't know, it's garbage, buy a new one. No, fix my TV. Two months went by, Vin, where's my TV? 
oh, it's a piece of garbage, and they went back and forth. It, you, know, you ever see New Yorkers fight? It's like being at the delicatessen in Publix when we're in season at Euro Beach. It's a bunch of New Yorkers fight. I came up that joke last sermon, so if that was a good one, it's not a script. Several months went by, and Matthew went to the shop and asked my dad, where's my television? You had it for three months, we're watching a small little TV. Sure enough, it was in the graveyard. <laughs> my cousin was so happy. When my dad did pass, he left a lot more than just the graveyard. We did have to salvage some of those TVs and call customers who thought their TV had been lost to the abyss. But one of the things that one of the things that my dad did leave was a legacy. Several years ago, I thought of this one, several asked to tell some more stories about my dad. I put a list of stories in a yellow legal pad. I came up with 67 stories that I could tell about my father. And I wonder. If somebody were to make a list about you and list things that you're known for or the many ways that you've touched someone on the legal pad, what would they come up with you and for you? In the middle of Blue 12, we fall into the middle of a family feud. These two brothers are fighting, and so one brother, we don't know his name, comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, Rabbi, can you please tell my brother to give my, inherit my portion of the inheritance to me? You get the feeling that perhaps during the funeral everyone was at peace and they got through and they had to get the arrangements to make sure that peace and order was held in the family. But, as, but no sooner did the dirt fall on top of the coffin that this family adhered to the letter of the law and sure enough at least one of the boys wanted a share of his inheritance. Now he calls Jesus teacher or rabbi. It was not uncommon back then for rabbis to adjudicate little local Conflicts. It was not uncommon for the person in authority to help families navigate through these things. And of course, Jesus would have known the law on this. It states clearly within Leviticus, somewhere in those chapters, that when a person dies, the inheritance is shared among the brothers or whoever is left and so on and so forth. And Jesus knew that when this person was coming to him, this person was really concerned about the letter of the law. This man appealed to the law, but Jesus did not respond with the letter of the law, and he did not appeal to the law. Instead, Jesus appealed not to the letter of the law, but to what was really at stake, and he gave the warning, be aware of greed. I wonder who Jesus was speaking to. Was Jesus talking to the man who was demanding the part, the portion of the inheritance, or was Jesus talking to the other brother who refused to give the inheritance away. We are not sure, but how Jesus responds teaches us that there's something more at stake than just a family feud over the inheritance. And he tells a parable of what we call the rich fool. In this parable, we see a man who has had a plentiful property, looks at his property, looks at all that he has, no barns can contain it, so he thinks to himself, what do I do with this stuff? I know what I'll do, I'll build more barns. He builds his barns, looks at his work, and he says to himself, Soul, drink, be merry, be happy, enjoy what you have. He says, You have many, he says to himself, I have many years to enjoy, let's be merry. Until finally God comes and says, On this very night, not many years, but on this very night, your soul will be demanded among you. Often when we read this parable, we turn it into something that it's not. Sometimes we talk about, say, for instance, income and quality, or we talk about wealth and riches and various things when we talk about this parable. But if we talk about it in that way, we're really going back to, I think, the letter of the law, and we're missing the spirit of what Jesus is talking about here. Notice how when Jesus talks about God's judgment on this man, he says, this very hour your soul is demanded of you. Notice what he says in verse 20. Look at it real closely. He says this, God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. But look what he knows, because it's not about wealth. Look at what he says. Then whose will the things by which you have provided, whose will it be? You see, it's not about the things, and it's not even about being married. In fact, if you go back to the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes affirms that every day is a gift, that we should enjoy what God gives us, thank God for God's blessing, and really be merry and enjoy our friends and have good friends, and really 
participate in all the joys of life. So in one respect, what this man is doing is very biblical. But in the other respect, we see that what's missing here is not necessarily the accumulation of wealth as it is the failure to think and to prepare beforehand of how to share the resources that he has. But all you have to do is look at the entirety of the parable to understand where Jesus is going with this. Notice that the man says, what should I do? He doesn't inquire of the Lord. Or, I have no place to store my crops, and I shall be married, I and this and my... And the question comes of how isolated this man might be. Where is his family, for instance? We don't ever see where his family is. Does he have a family? Do we know of a family? Or what about his workers? He never once affirms and perhaps encourages his workers. There are certainly people who are harvesting the field that produces these plentiful crops. And there are certainly people who build the barns, but he never once acknowledges them. And where is God in all of this? He never gives thanks for the bountiful harvest. And he never considers God in this equation, and ultimately he fails, not necessarily at the accumulation, but at considering his legacy. Considering how the things that God has given him is something that he has prepared in order to give away and to share with others. He had a condition, and that condition is the inflammation of an ego, because he was at the center of everything. And rather than enjoying that which he accumulated for many years, God came upon him and said, This very night, all of those things that you have, to whom will be given? And we're still not sure at this part of the parable whether this story is intended for the brother who wants the inheritance or the guy who refuses to give the inheritance. I really think that Jesus doesn't care. I really think that Jesus intends this parable for both, both brothers to hear. And intends for us to hear as well, because as Christ followers, we ought to consider our legacy. What is it that people will remember you by? And what is it that people will talk about you? And what is it that you have shared out of the accumulation of those things with which God has blessed you? Have you shared, for instance, your family history? We talked about dedicating Jacob today, and certainly we'll encourage this family to share their family heritage and history with this child. As he grows, he needs to know his roots and from whence he came and where he is going. Have you shared your history lately? Have you shared the things that your neighbors need to know, that your family needs to know, that your grandchildren or your children need to know? Are you willing to tell those stories that are important to you? Because in sharing your history, you find that you start to share your values. As people walk in and out of your life through your day, in and out of your day, as you walk with people, as you relate to people, are you encouraging them to, by sharing your values with them? Pointing to them that they are not the center of their story either. And that God is at work. Are you willing to share that kind of legacy? Are you willing to share your faith? You never know what opportunities may arise. And you never know the next opportunity that you have to share your faith where that night, God may come to that person and say, this very hour, your soul is required of you. And you don't know whether God will come to you and say to you this very hour. We do not have as much time as we think when it comes to the urgency of sharing our faith and the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you willing and generous with sharing your love? Not only loving others, but teaching people how to love. Teaching people and modeling for others the meaning of grace and the knowledge that goes along with knowing how to manage the world and to negotiate the world and then to negotiate relationships. Think of the people in your life who you have opportunities to share in your knowledge of what it means to love more graciously or to be hopeful, or to find healing in the loving, forgiving spirit of Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have you shared the legacy of your knowledge recently? See, people don't automatically know things. It's not like we can assume that people know how to do church. We can no longer assume that people know their Bible. We can no longer assume that people know how to
manage their budget or manage their life or go about faith, we can no longer assume that people know what it means to be hope-filled or to learn the meaning of grace. We can no longer assume that. We're in such a world in which knowledge and uh, the processing of information is so scattered through multimedia and various messages and messengers that no one really has a coherent, unified story anymore. So we can no longer assume, for instance, that our children know what hope is. You know, children nowadays are committing suicide at exorbitant rates. They are not rooted in family histories often. Sometimes they don't know what, uh, they can't see the hope beyond the day. And for many of our young people, they need you to speak into their life and to share the legacy that you have, that God has blessed you with. Be it stories of the Bible, or stories of your family, or stories of your values. All you have to do is ask yourself one question. What is it that you for? And what is it that you're not willing to give away? I think part of our problem uh, these days is that because of this, I think uh, one of our issues about our society is not necessarily the violence of video games and this and that. We can probably have a laundry list. But I think one of the issues is that people think that they, everything they, they experience is new under the sun. You, you ever run into young people or, or maybe even some senior saints who, who think that their issue, that their conflict and their relationships is new, that it's never been experienced by anyone else before? Or that the problem that they have has never been around, that it's brand new, as if God has never seen something like this before? Or you think that uh, the, the, uh, the church conflicts that may arise, that they're somehow new, that, that we've never had conflicts like that before. Our greatest detriment is thinking that, there, that everything we experience is new under the sun. And it's Ecclesiastes that tells us that there is nothing new under the sun. So your relationship, God has seen it before, and God will walk you through it. Your conflicts or the issues that you have, rest assured, and be filled with hope because nothing is too big for God to handle. And there are so many situations that you're going through where you may feel alone and isolated. But others have experienced. And we need to be mindful that we need to share with others our experiences when people confront things that they think is unique to them. This is part of sharing our legacy. It's helping people come out of the isolation so that they don't come down with the inflammation of the ego. And helping people to see themselves as a part of a larger picture of who they are. And it starts with encouraging you to see yourself as being a part of a larger picture of who you are. Jesus gives us practical antidotes, of course, for this inflammation, this condition. He says first in 1222, do not worry. Strive for the kingdom, he says. It's interesting because when I read this passage, the man doesn't worry. You know, he has a lot of things. He doesn't even worry. In fact, he's married. He doesn't worry. So what is it that Jesus is encouraging us to worry about? Remember, it's not about the clothing. It's not about the food. It's about the fact that there is more to the body than clothing and more to eating than just the food. There is more to our life than just worrying about the things we have, but rather to see beyond the provision. God gives us. So when he says, do not worry, this man isn't worried in the parable. It's the fact that he sees the accumulation of all this stuff as the end goal, rather than the relationships that are more important. In verse 12, 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, do not be afraid. Sell everything you have. And here we see that perhaps some of the greatest fears we have is over the fact that one will die and two will die alone. And that is not true, believe if you are in Christ, death is but a mere passage to eternal life, and you will not die alone. The Holy Spirit will hold you in the midst of your thoughts. And so Jesus says, do not worry. Do not be afraid. Be generous. And lastly, he says in chapter 12, verse 35, be dressed for action and be alert. Because this man thinks he has all the time in the world. And one of the lessons of this parable is that there is an urgent plea to share what God has given you in the leading of a legacy, in providing others the opportunity to get to know you, in gaining the wisdom that you have, in hearing the good word of the Lord that you may have, to understand and have people walk beside them and have the, a 
ability to receive the caregiving that you, believer, can provide. So as you think about it, you think about a legal path in your life. What is it that people might write about you? And are you considering your legacy? Amen.